Okay, so we're going to have a look at this really quite surprising result, the fact that any real valued random variable, you can always write this as just a transformation of a continuous uniform distribution. So here we're talking about the uniform distribution on the closed interval between 0 and 1. So we say that u has this distribution if the probability that u is less than or equal to small u is just equal to small u, this is for all u between 0 and 1. So to show that our random variable x is some sort of transformation of this uniform distribution, there's just sort of one trick that we apply here. So basically, the probability that u is less than or equal to u, if I substitute in, in place of u here, f of x, which is, this is absolutely fine because f of x, this is a probability, it's always between 0 and 1, so it's in the right sort of range of values. This is equal to f of x. Then what we're going to do next to manipulate this is we're going to use the fact that the CDF, this function f of x, is an increasing function, or at least a non-decreasing function. So let's draw a picture here of the CDF. Imagine we've got x here, and then we're drawing the CDF. This is some sort of increasing function. So you imagine you've got some sort of value up here f of x, and we know that f of x is greater than or equal to u, so we'll say that u is somewhere down here. And what's really interesting is when we consider the inverse, because u is less than or equal to f of x, and then we look at what happens to the inverse of u, so we've got down here f inverse of u, so you can sort of convince yourself in the picture this means f inverse of u has to be less than or equal to What's the inverse of f of x? That's just taking us back to x. So what we can say here is that u is less than or equal to f of x if and only if f inverse of u is less than or equal to x. So this is a really useful result that we're going to use in a sec. So you may have noticed here that actually the CDF of a random variable isn't always invertible. What we'll do is we'll assume for now that it is, because it turns out this isn't really a problem. You can define a right continuous inverse, and then the proof will carry forward just the same. So what we'll do is we'll deal with that at the end, but I'll just show the idea of the proof for now, assuming that it is invertible. So we're going to use this now. Because this inequality, u is less than or equal to f of x, this holds if and only if f inverse of u is less than or equal to x. So what we've actually got in here, this inequality, u is less than or equal to f of x, you may as well just replace that by f inverse of u is less than or equal to x, because these are the same thing. This happens if and only if this, so certainly they'll have the same probability. So this is the probability that f inverse u is less than or equal to x. This is still equal to f of x. But then don't forget what f of x is. This is the CDF of our random variable x. So this is the probability that x is less than or equal to x. So what have we shown here? Well, we've shown that the probability that f inverse of u is less than or equal to x, for all values of x, this is always equal to the probability that capital X is less than or equal to x. And what this means is that actually f inverse of u and our random variable x have the same distribution. Because if you've got the same CDF, this means you have the same distribution. So I'll write that equal in distribution. So we've shown here that f inverse of this uniform distribution has the same distribution as x, assuming that f is invertible. And this is actually a really interesting, really cool result, because if you imagine you want to take some sort of generate a sample using this random variable x on a computer, all you need to do is you generate a sample using a uniform distribution, which is really easy for a computer to do, then you apply the inverse of your CDF to that. And you may find actually in practice finding the inverse of a CDF is easier said than done, but still this is the sort of thing, this is used in practice. So for example, for a normal distribution, this it's impossible to write it in a particularly nice form. The, the inverse of the CDF, but there is a suitable sort of polynomial approximation which you can use, which is good enough. It can give you really accurate sampling from a normal distribution. So like the stats package R, this actually uses this sort of method to generate samples from 
a normal distribution. And just to show kind of pictorially what's going on, if you imagine we've got our uniform distribution, and say maybe you want to sample from, I'll just show you a really simple example, maybe you want the probability x equals 0 to be 1 minus p, you want the probability that x equals 1 to be equal to p, then all you need to do is you take this interval between 0 and 1, and you take a random sample from the uniform distribution on this interval, and then you split your interval up into a region of size 1 minus p, and then you've got your interval width p there. So if you get some data out from here, you turn these into zeros. So you've got a probability 1 minus p of your uniform distribution giving you values here. And then, so you get some data here, you turn that into a 1 using the inverse of the CDF. So this is a really nice way of just seeing it pictorially. That when you apply this transformation, you can turn sampling from a uniform distribution into sampling from any distribution you like. Okay, so we'll just make sure that we've covered the case where the CDF isn't necessarily invertible, just through a simple example here. So if you've got the probability x is 0 is 1 minus p, the probability x is 1 is p, drawn out the CDF, this red function here. Hopefully you can see this isn't going to be invertible because here it's many to 1, and also it's not super clear what to do with the discontinuities. So if you tried just taking the naive approach of reflecting this in the line y equals x, you get here this would be 1 minus p. You get a very strange looking picture that certainly doesn't look like a well-defined function. So what we need to do is we need to be a bit more clever about how we can define something that, well it's not the inverse of this function, it's going to have suitable properties, it's going to act as our inverse. So basically what we're going to do is change this blue picture a little bit. So if I call this f of inverse of t, and we'll say that we've got t here, then basically all I'm going to do to change the picture is go from here to here, and then instead of taking the value 0 at 1 minus p, I'm now going to turn this into jump up, so where we take the value 1 at 1 minus p, and then something very strange happens at t equals 1, we actually jump up to infinity, but we don't really care about that for the sake of using the uniform distribution. Okay, so this is what we call the right continuous inverse, and just show you how you define this more rigorously. So you define this f inverse t as the infimum of the set of real values x, so that f of x is greater than t. So this is quite a strange definition. It certainly takes some time to take this in. So we'll just have a quick look at this using our picture. So let's find f inverse of 0. So what's the smallest value of x so that f of x is greater than 0? Well, you start off with negative values of x, and then as soon as you reach x equals 0, you're greater than 0. So f inverse of 0 is 0. That's this point here. Then say for t somewhere between 0 and 1 minus p, what is the smallest value of x now so that your function f of x is greater than t? Well again it's just 0 because at this point when x is 0 you're now bigger than that t. So this is why your f of inverse of t is now still 0 here. Then something very interesting happens when t is 1 minus p. So what is the smallest value of x so that f of x is greater than 1 minus p. Well, it's equal to 1 minus p, and then you actually have to wait all the way until you get to x equals 1. So this is why f inverse of 1 minus p is 1. And then finally, if you've got some t greater than 1 minus p and less than 1, what is the smallest value of x so that your f of x is greater than t? So say that would be somewhere around here on your picture. Well, the smallest value of x so that you're above this level is x equals 1, where you jump up to 1. So that explains why this goes along to 1 here. And then why this jumps to infinity when t is 1. The smallest value of x, so that f of x is greater than 1, well, there aren't any values of x, so that f of x is greater than 1. So we're looking at the infimum of the empty set, which is infinity. So this is a bit strange, but we don't really care about that for the sake of what we're doing with the uniform distribution. So all we really care about is the fact that 
our new right continuous inverse satisfies u is less than or equal to f of x if and only if f inverse of u is less than or equal to x. So this was our key step in our proof earlier. So now you can extend this proof and generalize it using this property. So you can have a go at proving this from the definition if you like. But this allows us to generalize our result when the CDF isn't invertible.